Hello, thank you for attending my keynote speech on industry challenges and opportunities in megatrends in water and wastewater. The challenge with a topic this broad is what to cover. So much is happening in our field right now, but I'd like to start with my favorite quote from former Vice President Dan Quayle. It isn't pollution that's harming the environment, it's the impurities in our air and water that are doing it. Wrap your heads around that one as we dive into this uh, broad topic. So I'd like to generally discuss the challenges that our industry is facing, climate change, salts, emerging contaminants, and the shortage of qualified operators, and also solutions related to solving these water resource challenges. We'll talk about some of the statewide programs for water conservation and supply, direct and indirect potable water and uh, water reuse and also alternative delivery. I'm Mike Nunley. I'm the president and CEO of MKN. We're a water resources planning, engineering and construction management firm based in California. We have 45 staff and six offices. I was formerly the West Coast wastewater treatment practice leader and also the Central and Southern California operations manager for a national engineering firm. I have over 25 years of experience in water resource engineering with a bachelor's in civil engineering from Virginia Tech, a master's in civil and environmental engineering from Cal, and I'm also a, uh, an associate with the Design Build Institute of America. So the first topic I'd like to discuss is climate change and climate adaptation. State Water Board Resolution Number 2017-12 is titled Comprehensive Response to Climate Change. And it states that the Division of Water Quality shall work with the regional water boards to evaluate and by July 1st, 2018, make recommendations to the State Water Board on the need to modify permits and other regulatory requirements to reduce vulnerability of water and wastewater infrastructure to flooding, storm surge, and sea level rise. We've worked with a number of agencies on their climate change adaptation plans to meet these, this requirement. I think Ventura County's climate change planning efforts provide a good example of what others are facing and their county's 2019 climate change study gives a good overview of what many agencies can expect in the future. So to provide some background on Ventura, it has a climate similar to that of the Mediterranean with cool, dry summers at the coast and warm, dry summers inland. The winters are mild and wet, with the majority of rainfall occurring between the months of October and April. This past decade, a severe drought was followed by extreme late season wildfires. And events such as these suggest there's significant vulnerability to future weather and, and climate extremes. Projected increases in temperature, temperature extremes, and changes in precipitation characteristic could further exacerbate extreme events like the wildfires and drought. According to the conclusions presented in the report, projected changes in Ventura County climate, dated June 2019, for the 2021 to 2040 period demonstrated increases expected in both maximum and minimum temperatures and heat extremes, more intense precipitation focused during the winter season, and increased evapotranspiration. Increased drought risk, potential for a long, longer wildfire season with more ignitions as population growth continues, reduced marine stratus, reduction in Sierra Nevada snowpack, and longer duration and more intense atmospheric rivers are all noted as concerns for the region. The study projected the following impacts over time during, due to climate change. So first is changes in precipitation characteristics, both intensification and concentration into winter season, could have implications for groundwater recharge and how surface water is conveyed, captured, and stored. The increased potential for post-fire flash flooding and debris flows due to more frequent, short-duration, high-intensity rainfall since wastewater treatment facilities and lift stations are often at low elevations, flooding can affect them disproportionately compared to other water resource facilities. As you can see on this slide, planning for sea level rise ranges 
uh, it will require risk analysis. And this is, this is an excerpt from the 2018 sea level rise guidance document from the state of California. And this example is for San Francisco. The exhibit shows a range of emission assumptions uh, bracketed as, as high and low for each decade and also provides the probability that a given sea level rise meets or exceeds a specific depth. It brackets low risk, medium to high risk, and extreme risk aversion. And, but this broad range of assumptions results in a sea level rise range of, of in 2150 between 3.8 and around 22 feet. So how do agencies plan for this? How conservative will they be in their assumptions for infrastructure? So another challenge is the increased evaporative demand may affect what crops can be grown economically. It may alter ecosystem function and could increase drought susceptibility. Increasing temperatures and more frequent extreme or hot temperatures may have negative implant impacts on plants and workers' health. Increases in maximum temperatures and overnight minimum temperatures, as well as the frequency of extreme temperatures, will likely have negative impacts on human health and ecosystems, disproportionately affecting disadvantaged communities and impacting the species extent and abundance. Wildfire season will likely extend earlier into the spring and early summer, and later into the fall and early winter due to drying in these seasons, increased temperatures, and greater evaporative demand. There's still considerable uncertainty in predicting the future frequency, size, and intensity of wildfires. As shown on the exhibit for the 2009 station fire, wildfires can also have a significant impact on water quality through runoff of, of ash, debris, eroded soil, and other particulates. As shown on the graph, the suspended sediment concentration in samples collected during storms increased by three to four orders of magnitude within the burn area. Dissolved organic carbon increased by two to three orders of magnitude after the fires. This can impact water supplies, both uh, raw and water and shallow groundwater for communities and especially for wildlife and aquatic species. So the next topic I'd like to discuss is salt management. Again, a very broad topic and category of topics. But generally, we all know as water use increases, groundwater supplies can increase in mineral content. We cause seawater intrusion when we overpump near the coast. And when we import water, we import salt. Unlike the crisis scenarios California routinely prepares for, chronic water quality problems like salinity do not trigger overnight evacuations or mobilize teams of emergency personnel. DWR developed a salt and, man and salinity management plan, which is a strategy of the California Water Plan to help address this. And the exhibit shown here is from that study. They discuss salt import, import in addition to the release of salts through domestic and industrial usage. As you can see in this, uh, in this graphic, the state water project imports salt to the Central Valley because it imports critical water supply to the Central Valley. The Colorado River Basin imports over 3,000 tons of salt per year into Southern California, but we need the water, so we have to deal with the salt. Salinity generally shows up in localized areas, expands slowly, and produces incremental rather than event-based effects. The impacts can be measured yearly as a reduction in crop production and farmland, farmable land across an impacted region, lost jobs, higher utility rates, reduction of community growth potential, loss of habitat, premature corrosion of equipment, and lost opportunities. Salinity issues are rarely considered newsworthy until the impacts have already occurred. But managing salt today can avoid significant cost increases in the future. A State Water Resource Control Board study found that Central Valley salinity accumulations if unmanaged are projected to cause a loss of over $2 billion in California's value of goods and services produced by 2030. Income is expected to decline by over $900 million, employment by almost 30,000 jobs, and population by 
a little less than 40,000 due to the increase in commercial operating expenses incurred by water supplies that'll have higher salinity concentrations. Their study examined the impact to irrigated agricultural, confined animal operations, food processors, and residential water users. The potential benefits of implementing a salinity management program just in the Central Valley are estimated to be $10 billion with a B by 2030. So one question is always, is it a water supply or a wastewater treatment problem? And it really depends on who you ask. You can really, you can remove salt either place through treatment, although it's often less expensive on the supply side. You can reduce the wastewater concentrations of salt by limiting or banning water softeners or manning, managing industrial dischargers, but that can be politically challenging. Domestic use naturally adds salt, so domestic use and addition of salt is, is unavoidable, unavoidable to wastewater streams in some cases. So the next topic I'd like to address are emerging contaminants. So the per first is uh, PFAS and PFOS. In August 2019, the State Water Resource Control Board reduced notification levels of two long-change perfluorinated alkyl substance or PFAS compounds, perfluorooctanoic acid or PFOA and perfluorooctanosulfonic acid or PFOS to 5.1 and 6.5 parts per trillion, respectively, for public water agencies. Chemical names are quite a mouthful there. In February 2020, the State Water Board lowered the response level of PFOA and PFOS to 40 and 10 parts per thousand, or parts per trillion, respectively, from the original combined concentration of 70 parts per trillion. PFAS are man-made compounds, and they've been identified by the United States EPA as emerging contaminants. They've been used around the globe since the 1940s. And they're in a wide range of, of products and, and places in the environment. They can be found in food packaged in PFAS containing materials, processed with equipment that use PFAS, or grown in PFAS contaminated soil or water. Commercial household products, including stain and water repellent fabrics, nonstick products like Teflon, polishes, waxes, paints, cleaning products, and firefighting foams are a major source of groundwater contamination at airports and military bases where firefighting training occurs. It can be found in the workplace, including production facilities or industries like chrome plating, electronics, manufacturing, or oil recovery that uses PFAS. Drinking water, typically localized and associated with a specific facility, like a manufacturer, a landfill, a wastewater treatment plant, or firefighter training facility that have contributed to local concentrations of PFAS. It can be found in living organisms, including fish, animals, and humans, where PFAS have the ability to build up and persist over time. Certain PFAS chemicals are no longer manufactured in the United States as a result of phase-outs including the PFOA Stewardship Program, in which eight major chemical manufacturers agreed to eliminate the use of PFOA and PFOA-related chemicals in their products and as emissions from their facilities. Although PFOA and PFOS are no longer manufactured here in the U.S., they're still produced internationally, and they can be imported into the U.S. in consumer goods like carpet, leather and apparel, textiles, paper and packaging, coatings, rubber, and plastics. Certain PFAS can accumulate and stay in the human body for long periods of time. There's evidence that exposure to PFAS can lead to adverse health outcomes in humans. The most studied PFAS chemicals are PFOA and PFOS. Studies indicate that PFOA and PFOS can cause reproductive and developmental, liver and kidney, and immunological effects in laboratory animals. Both chemicals have caused tumors in animals. The most consistent findings are increased cholesterol levels among exposed populations with more limited findings related to low infant birth weight, rate, weights, effects on the immune system, cancer for PFOA, and thyroid hormone disruption for PFOS. 
due to the strength of multiple carbon fluorine bonds, PFAS break down very slowly in industrial use and in the environment. Due to their persistence in the environment and in organisms, migration potential in aqueous systems like groundwater, historical use in commercial products, and possible health effects at low levels of exposure, um, increased concern is warranted for their presence in potable water supplies. Following the reduction of the state water board mandated response levels for PFOS and PFOA in February of this year, it's expected that DDW will issue orders to groundwater wells producing water containing PFOA and PFOS must be removed uh, above the reporting limit or reporting level service are treated to remove the PFOA and PFOS, and many of our agencies are working on that now. The next topic is under the emerging contaminants umbrella, which is a very large umbrella, is microplastics. So there's an article in Forbes magazine I read recently that noted that uh, plastic pollution creating microplastics is a growing concern for human health. And emerging studies have found them everywhere, from drinking water, to in fish, seafood, and birds. Recent studies have been published showing the Atlantic Ocean contains more plastic than previously thought. Last year, the World Health Organization urgently called for more research into the health impacts of microplastics and a crackdown on plastic pollution, with a spokesperson saying, quote, they are everywhere. Microplastics are typically defined as less than five millimeters with nanoplastics, defined as less than a thousandth of a millimeter. But definitions have differed for years. This slide gives some examples of definitions from three different agencies prior to the State Water Board developing a definition this year. Hazards to humans are really poorly understood for microplastics and nanoplastics. Much previous research on microplastics and nanoplastics focused on its accumulation and effects in marine life with a particular focus on seafood that humans consume. Microplastics have been associated with neurotoxic effects in wild fish and increased oxidative damage, which can theoretically lead to greater risk of cancer. Some studies have also suggested that microplastics have no permanent effect on some fish, simply passing through their digestive tracts. They've also been found in insects and birds. There are no standardized methods for detection at this point. But in 2018, Senate Bill 1422 was filed. It required the State Water Board adopt a definition of microplastics in drinking water on or before July 1st, 2020, which they did. It also required the State Water Board on or before July 1st, 2021 to accomplish the following four tasks. First, adopt a standard methodology to be used in the testing of drinking water for microplastics. Second, to adopt requirements for four years of testing and reporting of microplastics in drinking water, including public disclosure of those results. Third, consider issuing a notification level or other guidance to aid consumer interpretation of results. And four, accredit qualified California laboratories to analyze microplastics. So yet another challenge that the industry faces is the shortage of qualified operators. According to a 2018 Bureau of Labor Statistics data, only 1% of water and wastewater operators nationally are 24 years old or younger, 1%. Sudden retirement, illness, or extended leave can impair system operations. We have a number of clients who faced this. Many folks on this uh, conference may, in this conference may have faced it. So there are some assistant pro apprenticeship programs that exist, but some are, and some are paid in various states, but not California. So it's not clear how we're gonna backfill those positions as an industry. So how are agencies coping? First, we've seen regional operator agreements among agencies. Those can cut costs, they can improve system performance, an example is the Ventura Regional Sanitation District it has contracts with municipalities in Ventura County. They're governed by a board, but they've stepped in and, and in some cases have competed with uh, private companies 
to offer contract operation services to agencies um, within Ventura County. Partnerships with private entities can meet the demand too, but the private companies often face the same staffing challenges. As a result, more agencies are asking for a higher level of automation at their facilities, acknowledging they may not have the number of operators they need, and this will add cost and complexity to projects. So it affects the capital budget as well. So there are a number of, um, of, of opportunities and efforts that are being conducted statewide to help remedy some of these challenges. So I'd like to talk a couple minutes about water conservation and supply and some of the statewide efforts that are um, going on now, even as we speak. So in 2018, new landmark water conservation legislation passed, and that consisted of AB 1668 and SB 606, and they provide a framework for water efficiency. They establish water reuse objectives and long-term standards for efficient water use that will apply to urban wa retail water suppliers. And this is compro comprised of use categories like indoor residential water use, outdoor residential water use, commercial, industrial, and institutional irrigation with dedicated meters, water loss, and other unique local uses. Provides incentives for water suppliers to recycle water. It identifies small water suppliers in rural communities that may be at risk of drought and water shortage, shortage vulnerability, and it provides recommendations for drought planning. It requires both urban and agricultural water suppliers set annual water budgets and prepare for drought. So from the moving from that policy perspective to the state water supply real projects perspective is the California water fix. So the planning for this process began in 2006. And uh, many of you are familiar with this. Uh, the initial project was called the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, and it involved um, moving water into the state water project with the least disruption to environmental habitats on the way. And uh, the initial Bay Delta Conservation Plan, BDCP, was viewed as a water, con water conveyance and also a habitat conservation project. It originally was a twin tunnel configuration and was intended to obtain long-term Endangered Species Act and California Endangered Species Act with federal and state permits by improving conditions for various species beyond the mitigation measures required for just the conveyance facility itself. In 2013, the draft's joint uh, environmental impact report and environmental impact statement was released. In 2015, DWR and Bureau of Reclamation split the project into two efforts. First, a conveyance effort, just the conveyance design and construction called the Water Fix Project. And the habitat restoration was split into a separate effort called the California Echo Restore. In the original project, the full project was a set of tunnels from near Elk Grove to Clifton Court Four Bay, just north of Tracy. And it included three separate tunnels, about 14 miles long, to connect to the intermediate four bay of the state water project. Then twin tunnels that would pick that up and run another 30 miles to connect the intermediate four bay to the Clifton Court four bay. In 2019, the governor announced support for a smaller single tunnel configuration instead of the originally envisioned twin tunnel configuration. In May 2019, DWR and Reclamation withdrew their joint water right petition, water right change petition, and they ended public hearings on the dual tunnel project. So the project's currently in engineering and environmental review as the simpler, smaller single tunnel project. The state's been consulting with tunneling contractors to discuss it based on the latest uh, public information available on that project. So another uh, opportunity or another approach has been one water planning or integrated water resource management. And that's the integration of stormwater, water, wastewater, 
and conservation to a holistic planning process. Traditionally, these um, utilities were designed and managed separately. With the one water concept, that's a paradigm shift for physical systems that manage water and institutional structures like water agencies. It approaches the water cycle as a single connected system. It creates linkages between water, stormwater, wastewater, and utilities that manage them. And it looks systematically at other areas that impact water systems, including land use, agriculture, and energy. Now, planners and engineers are working more collaboratively. Planners traditionally didn't work on water and wastewater systems, but now they're often engaged in natural resource conservation management, floodplain management, and green infrastructure. Now we're seeing more integration of water needs and challenges into local plans and regulations as well. So that's been a, a real positive to our industry. Another area of, of, uh, of opportunity is the development of direct and indirect potable water reuse programs and projects. AB 574 requires the state water board adopt uniform water recycling criteria, criteria for direct potable reuse through raw water augmentation on or before December 31st, 2023. So just a little over three years from now. In 2018 and 2019, the State Water Board solicited feedback from stakeholders and the public in a series of public meetings, comment periods, and board meetings. In 2021, the state plans to convene an expert panel. There's a growing trend for indirect potable reuse all across the state with more to come. One is the Pure Water San Diego project, and that's intended to provide a third of San Diego's water supply by the end of 2035. Pure Water Oceanside will meet 30% of that city's water supply by 2022. Pure Water Monterey has the goal of reducing regional groundwater pumping by 2,000 acre feet a year. And a smaller one is the Tehachapi Groundwater Sustainability Program. And the goal is to reduce 800 acre feet a year of imported water. I, I think a really um, strong and, and, and uh, successful case study for indirect potable reuse is the Albert Robles Center. This shot, slide shows the Albert Robles Center of the ARC. We have several staff that worked on this project with prior firms. Water Replenishment District manages two of the most utilized urban groundwater basins in the U.S. It's in southern L.A. County, and it manages the central and the west coast groundwater basins. It's the largest groundwater agency in the state. Groundwater provides 50% of the total water supply for the 4 million people in their service area. And that covers 43 cities within 420 square miles. Historically, these, they relied on imported water to meet demands that groundwater could not. WRD began the Water Independence Now program in 2023 to protect security of groundwater supplies. They developed a suite of projects aimed at maximizing local stormwater and recycled water sources to protect those basins. The ARC is a 5.2 acre facility in the city of Pico Rivera, adjacent to the San Gabriel River. It'll purify approximately 10,000 acre feet a year through an advanced water treatment facility. The process includes ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, UV disinfection, and advanced oxidation. Together with another 11,000 acre feet a year of recycled water, it'll deliver 21,000 acre feet per year to the San Gabriel Coastal Spreading Grounds, where water will percolate into the central basin. The ARC has meeting areas, a conference center, exhibits, and an education center to promote community engagement. As of 2018, as a result of this project, both of WRD's basins are now sustainable. This thinking is really impacting all wastewater plants, even agencies that aren't considering indirect potable reuse. Many agencies are considering upgrading to a higher level of treatment in anticipation of needing to implement 
a potable reuse project in the future. There, it's resulting in a higher level of automation and also a higher skill level for operations at these facilities. But an advantage is they're finding greater funding flexibility and grant opportunities by defining improvements as, quote, water projects and not as wastewater projects. So this is huge for agencies that are looking for funding for wastewater projects. Alternative delivery is also growing in the water industry. That's another area of, uh, of opportunity to address some of these water resource challenges. Alternative delivery is a term that covers everything except design bid build, but it's most commonly used to describe design build and construction management at risk. According to the 2018 annual research report on collaborative delivery use and growth in the water and wastewater sector by the Water Design Build Council, from 2013 to 2017, the use of alternative delivery, design build, and construction management at risk for water and wastewater grew from 3.4 billion to 5.3 billion, or from 8 to 12 percent of the total U.S. market. The forecast is it will represent over 6 billion of water and wastewater infrastructure in 2021. You can see some of the stats on this uh, on this slide from this same study. From interviews with uh, Water Design Build Council, owners stated that they liked several aspects of these types of projects. First is, first is more control of project design and implementation. Second, faster delivery. Third is integration from design through construction and operations. Fourth, clearer lines of responsibility. Fifth, better management of project risk. Sixth, is the history of success with these projects. Seventh, the interest and excitement of DB teams, the increasingly complex technical solutions that agencies need, and the potential for cost savings. So we covered a lot today, and I appreciate your patience in bearing with it. In closing, we face formidable challenges and trends ahead for the water supply and water recovery industries. But new technologies, partnerships, and policies involving owners, regulators, and private entities will help bring innovative policies, technologies, and facilities um, to the market to help address these challenges. Thank you for your time.